If you have your copy of God's Word with you this morning, would you turn with me to the book of Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. And as you are finding Ephesians, would you stand with me once more for the reading of God's Word? This morning we're going to focus on verses Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, but I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Many of them were probably thinking, this is it. I am going to die today. Or... At best, I'm going, back, I'm going back to slavery. This group of former slaves, they could, they could literally feel the ground rumbling beneath their feet. They could hear the horses in pursuit of their former captor, captors. And it was terrifying. I mean, they, they had finally tasted freedom, but, but there's a chance it's going to be taken away now. And they were panicked. They were trapped and there was nowhere to run and many of them began to doubt that they were going to make it, that they were going to last through the day. The Egyptian army was pursuing them. The Red Sea was before them. They had nowhere to go. It looked hopeless. And so they they cried out to their leader, Moses. And Moses cried out to the Lord. You know what happened. You know the story. And the Lord parted the waters. And they were able to walk through on dry ground. The children of Israel, they they walked on dry ground. I I mean, it's pretty incredible just to think about. They're, They're passing through the sea safely while God threw their enemies into confusion. And once they reached the other side safely... God let the Egyptian army in to come after them. And once they came, they didn't get dry ground, but the wheels of their chariots began to get clogged in the mud. And once the army was in between the walls of the sea, God closed the waters and he drowned the Egyptian army in the sea. And that day, as the children of Israel stood on the shore, And watched everything in amazement. As the bodies of the dead Egyptian soldiers began 
to wash up on the shore. It says that they feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. In the very next passage in Exodus chapter 15, it says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. They beheld and they experienced the salvation of God that day. They, and all that they could do is stand on the shore and praise God. They couldn't proclaim, look what we did. They, they couldn't boast in themselves. All they could say is, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my song. The Lord has done this. All they could proclaim is the Lord has done it. And this salvation that we see, this salvation from slavery in Egypt, it was but a slight foreshadow of an even greater salvation from slavery. If you are a Christian today, you have been, slave, you have been saved from slavery to sin. You, you have been saved from the hopelessness that you once lived just as the Israelites were utterly hopeless and incapable of saving themselves, we could never save ourselves. But God has fought for His people. And all that we can do is, is stand in amazement as we behold this glorious salvation and say, the Lord has done it. The Lord is my salvation and my song. And just as they stood on the shore and worshipped, that's what we must do as we behold this glorious salvation. We must praise Him for it. This is what biblical worship looks like. Biblical worship is a response to the revelation of who God is. His nature, His character, what He is like. It is a response to His marvelous works. So therefore, biblical worship is exalts the triune God of the Bible for who He is and what He has done. Stephen Charnock wrote that worship is an act of understanding and applying itself to the knowledge of the excellency of God and the actual thought of His majesty, recognizing Him as the supreme Lord and governor of the world. And this is what we call natural knowledge. And beholding the glory of His attributes in the Redeemer, which is evangelical knowledge. To, to put it simply, which I hope I sound like a broken record, worship is simply revelation and response. God has revealed, therefore we respond. He's revealed Himself in His Word and we respond in light of that revelation. So far in this series that we have been going through, thinking about priorities, distinctives of the church. Everything that we've heard so far in this series leads to what we're going to look at this morning and what we're going to be thinking about this morning. We began by seeing how the church must, must keep the Word of God as the center. There must be a centrality of the Word of God. And then we looked at how there must be gospel clarity. And then... Last week, we looked at the primacy of preaching. All of these priorities give us this revelation of God. That we, we must have the Word of God to get this revelation. And once we have this revelation, it, it should be leading to this. That we respond in light of this revelation. That we respond light, rightly. So therefore, we must be about biblical Trinitarian worship. This is what Christian worship is. This is what Christian worship must be. The church must be engaged in this. For we see in the scriptures that God has revealed himself as triune. He has revealed himself as 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Eternally, fully, and equally God. One in essence, three in person. This is the God of the Bible. He is holy and there is none like Him. This is the God that we worship. And we worship Him because this is who He has revealed Himself to be in the Scriptures. This is what Christian worship is. Now, as I stated in Sunday school, Mormons, they, they can't worship like this. They don't worship like this. Jehovah's Witnesses can't. Oneness Pentecostals can't worship like this because they... They are worshiping a God that's made in an image that they want, but not the way that God has revealed himself in his word. Some of these other groups might sing some of the same songs that we do, but they're not engaged in Trinitarian worship. Worship that praises the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So this morning, as we continue to think about the priorities of the church, we want to take time to think about biblical worship. Trinitarian worship. In order to do this, we want to zero in on Ephesians chapter 1. This passage gives us a picture of the type of worship the church must be engaged in. Now the book of Ephesians is just overflowing with the riches that are found in Christ Jesus for believers. This letter, it's written to Christians. We read it there in verse 1. It's to the saints in Ephesus. <coughs> to the saints in Ephesus. The saints, Christians, those who belong to God, the set-apart ones. He's writing to believers. And this letter shows us the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It is to be in Christ. Unified. United with Christ. And all throughout this letter, you will, as you read through the letter, you will encounter this phrase over and over again. Even this, in this passage that we read. Over and over again you see, in Christ, in Christ, in Him, in the Beloved. It's in Christ. It's in Him that the Christian life is found and all of the blessings and joys are in Him. And so this book, it begins... By showing Christians the glorious treasures that are in Christ. These first three chapters give us this this picture of what God has done in Christ. And the joy and the treasures that flow out of being in Him. And then uh, chapters 4 through 6 show us, okay, how do we live in light of that? Because of the grace that you've been shown in Christ, we get to chapter 4. Walk in a worthy manner of our calling to which we've been called. So this book, this letter, it it is a great gift to you, Christian, to help you see the riches and treasures that you have in Christ and to help you see how to live in light of that. But this morning, we we want to just focus on the beginning of this letter. We'll just look at verses 3 through 14. And this passage puts the magnificent triune God on display for us. And we see how the majestic three are at work in our salvation. And my hope is that as we behold this glorious salvation, and how the Father, Son, and Spirit are at work in saving saving a people for, for God, I pray that we would be overwhelmed with God's greatness And that we would respond rightly. That we would respond in praising our triune God. Now, as we look at these verses, we we don't see this in the English language, but in the Greek, verses 3 through 14 are just one long run-on sentence. It's, It's made up of about 202 words, and there's no punctuation here. Paul just keeps going. He just, he, he can't stop. I, I, I found it amusing. One commentator wrote about this in the Greek, and he said, he, he claimed that this passage was the most, monstrous, the most monstrous sentence conglomeration that he had ever found in the Greek language. I just thought that was funny, and I wanted to share it with you. Now, but in reality, here's what's happening. Paul, he knows how to write. He knows how to use punctuation, okay? Paul's educated. But Paul, 
is so overjoyed in proclaiming the sovereign grace, the saving grace of the triune God, he can't stop to take a breath. There's no time for punctuation when you're talking about this. This. There's no pause, no break. He can't stop. It's like he's saying, I must proclaim this glorious God and his great salvation. And that's exactly what he does. So let's look at this. Look, look there at verse 3 with me. This passage begins with a doxology, with a word of praise. It literally, is, that first word is where we get our word for eulogy. It's a good word being spoken. But as the passage grows from here, it goes from being a doxology to a Trinitarian doxology. It just keeps expanding. But it begins with, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. This is huge. Essentially what Paul is saying here is blessed be God because God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Blessed be God. Now we, when we say bless, blessed be God, what we need to distinguish here because we're saying we bless God and God blesses us. Is the same thing happening here? Well, we bless, we praise in response to His blessing us. God has blessed us out of the overflow of Himself. He's, he's given according to the riches of His grace. He has blessed us. Therefore, we respond by, in response to receiving this blessing, we respond by blessing Him. We've been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now notice, it's in Christ. When commentators said to be in Christ is to partake of all that Christ has done, all that He is, and all that He ever will be. So if you are in Christ, Paul's talking about you. He, he's saying that you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. These blessings are yours. Spiritual blessings for spiritual people. All of the blessings that we see throughout this passage are for those who are in Christ. All blessings come to the believer through Christ. God, God uses Christ to get us the blessings here. It's in Christ. Now with that being said, let me make it very clear here that if, you're, if you are not in Christ, these spiritual blessings are not yours. These glorious realities, you, you can't claim these as yours. So I plead with you. To, I urge you to turn from your sin and to trust in Christ. To come to the fountainhead of all blessing and joy and come to the fountain and drink freely. To come to Christ, to turn away from your sin and to trust in Him to make you right with God. For those who are in Christ are blessed with every spiritual blessing. True, lasting blessing. Blessing that cannot be taken away. So repent and trust in Christ. There is infinite joy and blessing to be had. Now, there's a lot of people out there today. A lot of televangelists. A lot of big name preachers that, that preach about blessing. Let me just throw out the disclaimer. Beware. I know we... He's the easy target, but he's out there a lot and he's got a great dentist. Beware of Joel Osteen. Okay? Beware of him. Beware of Joyce Meyer. Beware of Stephen Furtick. These, these preachers that would say, God wants you to be blessed materially. He wants you to be blessed in your health. He wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. They, we call what they're preaching the prosperity gospel, but let's face it, they're not preaching prosperity. Ephesians 1. This is the real prosperity. This is what God is offering. So beware of these short-sighted, this, this lame, short-sighted, fake gospel that they're proclaiming. Come to Christ and receive the true prosperity. The spiritual blessings that come through being united with Christ. So because... God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We must ask the question, 
What must we do? What do we do with this information? Well, we bless God. In other words, we praise him because he has blessed us. And so that leads to the question that I want to ask this morning to help us see how we engage in Trinitarian worship. The question is, how has God blessed us? And this, this breaks, the passage breaks apart pretty easily. We see all three persons of the Trinity, and that's kind of our, our breaks here in this passage. Verses 3 through 14 answer this question. We see how God has blessed us through the work of the Father, through the work of the Son, and through the work of the Spirit. And so let's, let's examine the text today and think through how God has blessed us. <coughs> Firstly, we see here, the beginning of verse 3 through 6, we see the Father has shown us sovereign grace. The Father has shown us sovereign grace. As we saw there in verse 3, we've been blessed. Blessed be God the Father who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's saying we've been blessed. And then look at verse 4. Even as. Those two words basically Paul's saying here's how. Here's what that looks like. Let me show you what the blessing looks like. So he says even as. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose. He, he selected. He, he, this is election. God has elected us in Christ to be his people. I mean, we're very familiar with elections in this, this country. I mean, every four years, we have a presidential election, right? We, our country chooses a man to be the commander-in-chief of this country, and we make the choice based on his merits and qualifications, or at least we used to in the past. Um, but when God chooses people, his election works a little bit differently. When he chooses, he doesn't choose based on merit or qualifications. His election is unconditional. It is his sovereign choice. Uh, look, it says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before the world was ever formed, before any human being ever walked the earth, before, before there was anything, God had made a choice. He, he, he chose. If you're, if you're in Christ, He chose you not based on anything you've done or ever would do. And many people will argue, I'm sure some of you have heard the illustration that, well, God just looked down the corridors of time and He saw who would trust in Him, and so He chose those people. That's not, that's not what it's saying here. Even then, we would have reason to boast, wouldn't we? Because we could say, well, I had faith. No, we have no reason for boasting here. And besides, if God looked down the corridors of time, God wouldn't learn anything. Because he knows the end from the beginning. God knows everything. God never learns anything because he knows all things. So before the world was ever formed, he chose us. Not based on anything in us, but he chose us in Christ. And this is good news I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote in his autobiography. I absolutely love this. I echo what Spurgeon said. He, he wrote, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should have never chosen him. I am sure he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. He must have elected me for reasons unknown to me for I could never find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. If he hadn't chosen us, we never would have chosen him. And the, scripture makes, the scriptures make this extremely, explicitly clear. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 11 says, There's none righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. As we heard Dave preach a few weeks ago in Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. 
you know what dead people are good, what dead people can do? I used to say nothing. Yeah, nothing. I heard one person say they can do one thing, stink. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's true. That, that was me outside of Christ. I stunk, yeah. Yeah, we can do nothing. John 8, 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Outside of Christ, we're enslaved to our sin. We, we do the will of our master. So what do we do? Sin. We choose sin over God. And then if that's not enough, I mean, just think, these three verses paint this horrible picture of the state we are in apart from Christ. None of us sought after God. None of us have the ability to seek after God because we're spiritually dead. And even if we did, we wouldn't because we're slaves to sin. Jesus put it like this in John 6, 44. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. On our own, we don't have the ability, the can to come to God on our own. Now we understand, we understand this very vividly. Well, it, it, you remember in school, you ask the teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And what did the teacher say? I don't know. Can you? Hated that. To this day, drives me crazy. Can you? Now the teacher's wanting to teach us something here. The teacher's wanting to teach you to say, may I? To teach you about permission because can is ability. We don't have the ability to come to God. Permission's not the problem. The invitation is open. Come. The problem is we can't. We're dead. We cannot come to God. Now, on our own, we never, we never could, and we never would. But he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's simply astounding. Now, even though this passage, this text, we, we could spend time in Romans 9 that goes much even more in depth showing God's sovereign choice. But right here, this is explicit. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Even though this is explicitly clear, there are still some who would object to God's sovereign choice and say, no, no, no. Why would God choose some and not others? I know I've asked that question in the past, and I'm sure some of you have probably asked that too. But that question is missing the point of this astounding reality. That's, we're not asking the right question here. We're not, we shouldn't be asking, why would God choose some and not others? We should be asking, why would God choose any? God would be perfectly just to send us all to hell. And he would, he would be just and righteous and good. Because we have transgressed his law. The, God doesn't owe us anything except his judgment. Why would God choose any of Maybe right now I hope you're asking the question, why me, God? Why in the world would you show grace to me? Now, if God passes over a person and leaves them in their sinful rebellion, it would lead to their eternal damnation. And as I said a moment ago, God would be just in allowing them to be damned for their sins because they have transgressed his law. Their, their damnation is all on them. But when God saves a sinner, it's all grace. From beginning to end because the only reason why that person is saved is because of God. Because he chose to show grace. And this should absolutely astound us that God would choose any of us. J.C. Ryle wrote, the believer who knows his own heart will ever bless God for his election. 
I, I, I know I'm going to butcher this quote is by John Newton. There's three things that will amaze me in heaven. Um, people, I, I'll see people that I didn't expect to see there. I won't see people that I thought to see there. And I will be there. <laughs> it's an amazement. And it's all grace. All grace. And because God shows his love to set his love upon us before the foundation of the world. Now, I can't help but to beg the question even more, why would God choose any of us? Keep looking with me in Ephesians 4. Shows us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. God the Father has chosen a people for himself in order to make them holy and blameless. God doesn't save people so that they can remain in their sin. He loves them so much that he would save them to get them out of their sin. First Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen race. There it is again. He's chosen. Chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He, he's chosen his people in order to bring them out of their sinful rebellion. He, he's, brought, he's chosen them that he might sanctify them, to make them holy and blameless before him. Now right now, we're, so we're in the middle of June right now. We're, we're in the middle of what America now celebrates as Pride Month. And companies across this country automatically, June 1st, will change everything to, to show that they support the LGBTQ agenda. This month, people who, who live in these lifestyles, people living in rebellion to God and His good design, they, they flaunt their rebellion. They, they celebrate the, these, these lifestyles that are contrary to God's good design. And sadly, in the midst of this month, and even more so, sadly, year-round now, there are more and more churches, I'm going to go on and say churches, that will proclaim a message of tolerance concerning sin. They will, they will proclaim a false gospel that tells people that you can, you can come and you can come to God and you can continue in your sinful ways. You can keep your sin. They'll proclaim God loves you just the way you are. Come just as you are. You don't have to change. Now please hear what I'm saying right now. No matter what your sin is, Christ welcomes you. There is grace. So come as you are to Christ. There is forgiveness and eternal life for all who come to him by faith and repentance. Jesus loves you. But he loves you not the way you are. He loves you despite the way you are. He, he loves you so much that, that he's died to save sinners from their sin. So hear the gospel call today. To, that Christ has died and risen to save sinners. So come to Christ and know that you are welcome here. But know this. All who truly come to Christ cannot remain the same. You cannot. Those whom God saves, He sanctifies. He doesn't save you so you can remain in your sin. He saves you to something so much better. Come to Christ and be changed. God has chosen His people for this glorious calling. Holiness. Or as Paul put in Romans 8.29, He predestined them to be conformed to the image of His Son, God has called this people in order to make them to be like Jesus. What a glorious calling. We are chosen for this new nature. No longer the old, dead, sinful man, but alive in Christ and being conformed and sanctified to be like him, to be holy and blameless. But it's not just that he's chosen us for a new nature. He's predestined us for a new status. Look as the verse continues, verse 5. He, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. 
He loves his people so much that he's given them this magnificent destiny of sonship. He predestined, he, he decided beforehand that this people, the people that he has chosen in Christ, the people he chose to, for holiness, he decided, I want them in my family. I'm going to adopt them as my children. Adoption of sons through Jesus Christ. He's going to do it through the finished work of Jesus. Now, don't pass over that so quickly. This is no small thing. J.I. Packer wrote, Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Even greater, even higher than justification. Now, I want to pause there for effect. Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers even higher than justification. Here's why. He says, To be right with God the judge is a great thing. To be loved and cared for by God the Father is a greater thing. Oh man, it's good. He has adopted us as sons of God. And now we have this great inheritance in Christ as his sons. I want to skip to verse 11 here. We see this in verse 11, that in Christ we've obtained this inheritance. It's the inheritance that the sons, the children get. 1 Peter 1.4 calls this inheritance imperishable, unfading, undefiled, and kept in heaven for you. This means that if you are in Christ before the world began, He chose you to be like Jesus. He set His love on you and decided to make you His own child. And now He has this great inheritance for you as His child. How has God blessed us? Grace upon grace upon grace. Guess what? More grace. It's just more blessing. And we read that he did all this according to the purpose of his will. This is his desire. He delighted to do this. It pleased God to do this. That's what we read in verse 11 as well. That God worked all things according to his purpose. According to the counsel of his will. This is his plan. And he's carrying it out. Because that's, that's what the psalmist says in Psalm 115.3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. It pleases him to do this. To show sovereign grace towards us. And ultimately, he did all of this to the praise of his glorious grace. God's ultimate purpose in salvation is the sal his ultimate purpose in, in our salvation is his glory. By choosing save helpless, undeserving sinners such as us. He is magnified. He, he is lifted high as the God who saves. He is magnified as the God of all grace. So we behold how the Father has shown us sovereign grace. He has chosen us in Christ. So how do we respond? Blessed be God. All praise to Him. Glory be to the Father for His sovereign grace. But let's continue on. Let's keep working through this passage. We continue to see another way that God has blessed us and we see that the Son has shown us redeeming grace. Verse 7 we, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Paul is declaring that through Christ's shed blood, it's almost like he's using this as shorthand to, to talk about the gospel. <coughs> through his shed blood, through Christ's finished work. Christ is, he is our substitute Living the perfect life of obedience that we failed to live. He is, he's fully obeyed the law. That makes him the perfect lamb of God. And then dying on the cross in our place. Taking the full penalty of our sins upon himself. Dying as the perfect sacrifice. 
and then rising from the grave, he is the accepted sacrifice by God. And so it is through his shed blood, through this finished work, we have redemption. In other words, he has freed us. He has delivered us. Revelation 1.5 says to him, to Jesus who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Colossians 1.13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We have died. We should have died in the domain of darkness. We should have been left there. We were his enemies. We were slaves to sin. We rebelled against him. He despised his rule and reign. But God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He has died for us. He has delivered us. This is grace. This is the picture that, that we see in Exodus. God redeemed his people from Israel, uh, from Egypt, sorry. God redeemed his people from Egypt. He he delivered them from their slavery. How much greater is our deliverance? We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, For as far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. He, he infinitely removes them. Micah seven nineteen. He will have compassion on us. He will, tread our, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. We have the forgiveness. The forgiveness of, of, our, of all of our sins, of our, chest, our trespasses, our transgressions. It's complete, total forgiveness. Now, how does God go about doing this? Look, continue to look there with me in verse 7. It says that he does this according to the riches of his grace. All right, do you catch it? All right, I'm going to read it again. How does he do it? According to the riches of his grace. Notice Paul didn't say that God, that, that we're forgiven, that this is out of the riches of his grace. But it's according to the riches of his grace. There, there's a big difference here. Kent Hughes gave the illustration of, think of John D. Rockefeller. He was one of the richest, he, he was the richest man in the world at his time. The richest man America had ever produced at that time. And if Rockefeller wished to give his riches, there were two ways that he could have done it. He could have gave according to, to his riches, or he could have gave out of, from his riches. History most often records that he did the latter when giving riches. One of the most famous pictures of Rockefeller shows him as a, an old wrinkled man dressed in a top hat and a cutaway coat, giving a dime to some little orphan. Rockefeller reportedly did this many times for the press to get a picture but think what it would have been like if he had given according to his riches. If he, if he would have done that, perhaps he could have given that little orphan a grand estate, a massive wealth to help him in his life. You see, when God gives, he doesn't give out of the riches of his grace. He gives according to the riches of his grace. He gives out of the bottomless depths of his riches. And when you remember and think about how awful you were before you met Christ, think about how, how awful you are even today. There's still times when we're not the most likable people. Still times when we sin and we, we don't do as we ought to. God poured out grace. And he's done it according to his riches. 
He doesn't just give you a dime's worth. He lavishly pours it out upon you. So it's no wonder, as we think about this, it's no wonder that amazing grace has such a sweet sound. It, it, it's, it's no wonder that Paul is writing this, monstros, mon, this monstrous Greek conglomeration of words. There's, there's no wonder about this because when you think about this former Christian killer, and how he has been shown such grace, how can he not be amazed? Christian, how can you not be amazed that God would lavishly pour out his grace upon you, that he would show you such forgiveness as this? And this, this grace, this forgiveness that God shows, it's not uncalculated. He does this in all wisdom and insight. God knows what he's doing. This isn't reckless love here. God, God's grace is calculated here. He knows exactly what he's doing. He delights in doing it. So he lavishly pours out his grace. So that as we behold this, we behold the saving, sovereign grace of God and this redeeming grace, when we behold all of this, we're seeing God's wisdom in action. And this should cause us to praise Him. And by pouring out His grace, God is making known to us the mystery of His will. It's the mystery. Uh, he's revealing His plan to us, and at the center of it is Jesus. Uh, look there at verses 9 and 10. Making, by doing this, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So in Christ, what's being said is he's going to unite all things together, things in heaven and things on earth. So Christ's redemption, yes, there is, there is personal redemption here. We are freed. But through the finished work of Christ, there is cosmic redemption here. The fall has ruined everything. When sin entered the world, it was followed by death and decay. Romans 8 tells us that creation is groaning. Not only creation is growing, we are groaning. We, we are in decay. It's getting harder and harder to get out of bed in the morning, isn't it? It's because we're decaying. It's effects of the fall. But in this, this world is not as it should be, but it is not going to stay that way because of the finished work of Jesus. In the return of the king, after the final battle, Samwise Scamji awakes, surprised to see Gandalf, who was thought to be dead. And he said to Gandalf, I thought you were dead. And then I thought I myself was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? In Christ, it is a resounding yes. Yes. He's uniting all things in him. John Stott wrote, In the fullness of time, God's two creations, the whole universe and his whole church, will be unified under the cosmic Christ, who is the supreme head of both. Christ has not just redeemed his people. He redeems his creation, and he is at the center of it all. So what's God's purpose in this? Why is God doing this? Well, verse 11 and 12, we see that he has worked all of this according to the purpose of his will. According, according to the counsel of his will, the purpose of his will. So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. God saves sinners for his glory. We experience his sovereign, redeeming grace, and the response, all oh, glory be to God. Glory be to the Father for His sovereign grace. Glory be to the Son for His redeeming grace. But look how this, this passage wraps up in the last two verses. We see that the Holy Spirit shows us preserving grace. These last two verses 
show us that those whom the Father has chosen, the Son redeems and the Spirit seals them. Verse 13 shows us that when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you heard the good news that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, when you heard that and believed it, what he is describing is what it looks like when a person trusts in Christ. This is how you enter the Christian faith. This is how you become a Christian. You must hear the gospel and believe it. Faith and repentance. This is how God saves sinners. The gospel goes out. It is proclaimed. A lost person hears it. And the Spirit of God opens their heart to the gospel and causes them to believe it and trust in Christ. That's what Paul is describing here. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, by the gospel. You must hear it in order to believe it. In Acts chapter 16, we read of Paul and Silas as they are in Philippi and they, they meet with some women who had met to pray and there was a woman named Lydia there. And as Paul and Silas were, were telling of Christ and as they were proclaiming the gospel, it says that Lydia, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. God opened her heart to the gospel. And as a result, we see in that passage, she believed. If you are not a Christian here today, this is my prayer for you. My prayer is that God would open your heart to the gospel. I know you're hearing it physically. Now I'm praying that God would take it from your ears and get it to your heart and cause you to believe it. Now when a person hears and believes the gospel at that moment... Something else is happening. And that's what we see here in verse 13. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It, it, these two things are happening simultaneously. As you hear it and believe it, at that moment, the Holy Spirit is sealing. Now when the Holy Spirit seals us, this... He, he's placing a sign upon God's people, a sign of ownership, a sign of security. This has implications for us here. First, it means you belong to God. He, his seal is upon you. The Holy Spirit is now dwelling within you, and that is his mark of ownership. You belong to him. 1 Peter 2.9, once again, your chosen race, a royal priesthood, Holy nation, a people of his own possession. You belong to him. And because you belong to him, oh, that's good news, because that means nothing can take you from him. Isn't that what we see throughout the scripture? Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am sure of this, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus proclaimed in John 10, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Holy Spirit dwells within you. It's a sign that you belong to Him. He has sealed you. Therefore, nothing can separate you from Him. But it's not just that you belong to God. This also means God belongs to you. The Spirit, as we see here, He is the guarantee of our inheritance. The down payment, the deposit, the pledge of the inheritance. I love, once again, Ken Hughes, he put it this way. Imagine the sublimest. Okay, it's going to bother me. The most sublime. I believe that's the correct. But he wrote sublimest. The most sublimest, most treasured experience of the Holy Spirit you've ever had. And then realize, this is only a foretaste. This is only the tip of the tongue on the spoon of what is to come. Remember the time when in worship you were smitten in awe of God. 
Remember the time when you followed the Spirit's leading and you were wonderfully used. Here on earth, we've experienced the first dollar of a million celestial dollars. The earnest, the pledge. We have the dawning knowledge, but then we will have the midday sun. When you trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit sealed you, came to dwell within you, believer. Right now, you get to, inst- you get to start enjoying your inheritance. Here and now, here and now, you get to begin enjoying just, just a taste of what is to come because you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. John Owen wrote, By the Holy Spirit, then, we get a foretaste of the fullness of that glory which God has prepared for those who love Him. And the more communion we have with the Holy Spirit as an earnest, the more we taste of that heavenly glory that awaits us. The Holy Spirit, He is that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. God has given us the gift of himself. The Holy Spirit, he he seals us and he ensures that we will acquire the inheritance that we have been predestined for. He will make sure, he will see to it that the people that the Father has chosen and the Son has redeemed, he will make sure that they make it to the end. He, He seals them so that they will. He will preserve them. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. One of the ways he's doing that, the Spirit sealed us. Jesus said in John 6, 37 to 40, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Jesus is proclaiming that all of God's people will be saved. He's he's proclaiming that all that the Father has chosen and all whom He dies for, none shall be lost. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes... What happens when someone hears the gospel when they look on the sun and believe? The Spirit seals them. The Holy Spirit ensures that none of these will be lost. Praise God. Christian, just look back over your own life. We've tried to lose our salvation a lot of ways, haven't we? I love what MacArthur said. If you could lose your salvation, you would have already. Something to that extent. Yeah. We're really good at sinning, and we've, we've tried pretty hard to lose our own salvation. But the Spirit seals God's people, and He ensures that none of these shall be lost. He, he continues to preserve us and causes us to persevere to the end. So we, we see all of this, all of how the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all the, Just grace upon grace. How they've all worked for our salvation. Why would God do this? Well, it's right there at the end of the passage. To the praise of His glorious grace. That is God's ultimate purpose in our salvation. His glory. Our salvation, it is all grace from beginning to end. Our salvation is the work of God alone. Therefore, it is soli deo gloria, isn't it? To God alone be the glory from eternity past to eternity future. God saves his people. And when we behold this great salvation, the only response is blessed be God. Glory be to God the Father Glory be to God the Son. Glory be 
to God the Spirit. Yesterday, I was, I was finishing studying for this sermon. And as I was studying, I was listening to a symphony orchestra play some music of one of my favorite composers, Hans Zimmer. I was listening to Love Me Some Hans Zimmer music. And this orchestra had everything. Uh, they, there was multiple percussions. There were a massive uh, strings section of violins, cellos, you name it. French horn, guitars. At one point, I saw a person that I uh, looked over to the video, and the person had an accordion. I'm like, I don't know where that's coming in. But as the song goes on, it would begin very softly with one or two instruments, and then it began to build and build. And finally, I just had to stop stop reading and just sit there and listen because it was so beautiful. The, the symphony, uh, just it, it was just it was magnificent. Well, here in this passage, we see a symphony of grace, of God's saving grace. We see the Father, the Son, and Spirit all doing, carrying out a different role and work in our salvation. And together, it puts forward this glorious salvation. And as we behold it, may we just proclaim, glory be to God. So this passage, it gives us this picture of what biblical Trinitarian worship looks like. We see the Father, Son, and Spirit, how they have worked our salvation. And then we respond in light of it. So this morning, if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, hear the symphony of saving grace. Hear how the Father, Son, and Spirit have worked your salvation. Behold the sovereign grace. Behold the redeeming grace. Behold the preserving grace. And lift your voice in praise to God. Live your life in response in praise to God. Go and proclaim this great God and His saving grace to others. So that they may hear the symphony of grace as well. And if you are here today and you are not trusting in Christ. Once more I plead with you. To turn from your sin and hear the call of the gospel today and come to Christ. Don't continue in your sinful rebellion but come to the fountain of all blessing. Christ alone come to Christ and be saved there is forgiveness for all who come by faith and repentance and he forgives according to the riches of his grace would you pray with me this morning Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we praise you because you are the God who saves. And you alone can save. We thank you for your saving grace that you've shown us. We who are such undeserving and unworthy people. Oh Lord, as we beheld it today, as we beheld this, this grace, we ask that you would help us to not get over it. Lord, help us to forever be in amazement and to always be living in light of it. Lord, we ask that if anyone here does, is not trusting in Christ, we ask right now that you would open their hearts to the gospel. Oh Lord, please cause them, as they've heard the gospel, cause them to believe it. And I pray that they would experience this saving grace today. And we pray this all for your glory. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.